This first week we're taking a look at form and pattern, which is probably the earliest concern of material culture scholars who are seeking to understand how material objects exist as distinct forms of cultural expression, as well as understand how such objects came to be in the world. In particular, early material culture scholars were very influenced both by art historical approaches that attempted to understand specific artistic forms and as an expression of the mind of individual makers, as well as structural anthropology, uh, through which scholars attempted to understand the deep structures of mind that undergird cultural expression. These two approaches, particularly those of structural anthropology, had a great impact on the way in which material cultures came to understand form and the way in which form lived as a concept and cultural construct in the mind of creators. I start with this slide, and this is actually an image of a language uh, flashcard that was designed for toddlers. And I just happened to come across it online many years ago, and it struck my fancy because it really does kind of gesture towards this idea of form and as well as the way in which language signifies form and that we have this idea of what is a chair, that there is a word chair that signifies this specific object and we also have in our mind an understanding of what a chair is as a form, as a kind of furniture, uh, what it's used for, uh, how it should look, at least in some basic way. So we're going to start with form. Form is one of the three characteristics that James Dietz claims all artifacts possess, the other two being space and time. Formal dimension specifically resides in the physical aspects of artifacts. It's the configuration of the object, its ness, if you will. Henry Glassy, in his seminal work, Pattern of the Material Culture of the Eastern United States, has a slightly different but related formulation which claims that any material object must be broken down into its components. Fundamentally, it will have form, construction, and use. Of these basic parts, the most important is form, Glassy writes. The typology and cross-cultural classification of material culture must be based on form only. That is, in the establishment of a chair type, the construction of the chair and the use to which it are put are not considerations. Now we might argue with this, but from a structural point of view, in the 1970s when Glassie's writing his book, form is the most important aspect of an object. Form usually follows function, and form is important according to Glassie because it allows us to understand the deeper structures in which the creator of a chair, for instance, is working within. We could certainly argue, as I said with his formulation, that construction and use are less central. But from the point of view of art understanding artistic production, form is central. But form is also important to Glassy uh, because it is the most unchanging aspect of an object. Because it follows function, it is relatively constant. And as Jules Prown says, it is the variable against which stylistic variables play. So form is the most constant uh, attribute of any material cultural object, in part because it corresponds to the essence, or the, as I call it, the ness of an object. <clears throat> How do we understand form? Form is a very abstract concept on one level when we start talking about the essence of an object, for instance. But form can also be understood through a concrete, visual, and tactile engagement with an object, with the aim of understanding its fundamental characteristics. Glassy points out that any object's form can be separated into primary and secondary characteristics. According to Glassy, the primary characteristics of a folk house type, for instance, would be height, floor plan, uh, possibly stylist trim and appendages such as ports and additions would be secondary considerations. So on the one hand we have height, floor plan, spatial understandings, primary characteristics, trim, appendages, uh, construction materials would be secondary characteristics. 
Thus, form refers to the constituent elements of a work of art, independent of its meaning. So when we consider a table or a chair or a house, the color is not really what's most important, except in rare cultural examples. Construction, what the house is made of, is important, but also secondary, unless, say, it's a log cabin, in which case we might say that the logs are in fact an important secondary characteristic. At a deeper level, the house has a deeper form that embodies spatial and proxemic understandings. The height, the floor plan, these are its primary characteristics. So dimension, line, mass, medium, scale, shape, and so forth are the most important aspects of form. Secondary features might be balance, composition, contrast, harmony, proximity, rhythm, similarity, unity, and variety. How do we come to understand form? As Glassy points out, we seek patterns. So in order to understand form, we look at patterns within the objects that we find. As Glassy points out, all objects are simultaneously sets of parts and parts of sets. They are text sets of parts to which meaning is brought by locating them in context, and then we analyze them as part of sets. One of the ways in which we come to an understanding of form is by creating sets of objects and formulating typologies. Typology is the study of types, the study or systematic classification of types that have characteristics or traits in common. As Dietz points out, the classification of objects based on similarity of form is what a typology is. A typology is an abstraction, but it's based on a concrete examination of similarities between objects. To create a typology and understand form, the first thing we do is establish a series and identify patterns of commonality and divergences across that series. We seek patterns. So we set, we create a series of multiple artifacts, we arrange them into a set, we look for patterns across that set, and we establish a classification of the artifacts according to the characteristics that we see. Now we can do this in several ways. We can do this primarily at the axis of time and space. Now, this is actually a, a diagram that comes from linguistics from uh, de Saussure, uh, but um, Glassy uses this a lot to think about how we can look for patterns within objects in time and space. Time is the axis of successions over time, the way things appear over the course of time. In other words, diachronic. And you'll hear me use this word diachronic. Diachronic simply means across time. Space is the axis of simultaneities. Within a specific time, across space, we can also see uh, simultaneous things, or what we would call synchronic, uh, synchronic forms. So you'll hear me use these terms diachronic, synchronic. They simply mean form across time or form within time across space. So let's get more concrete here using the example of the salt box house, a vernacular house type specific to New England, emerges during the colonial period. James Dietz talks about this um, house form, of course, in all in small things forgotten. Approaching the salt box house from both a diachronic and a synchronic form, we can first look at the colonial period and look at the emergence of this form we can say that within a specific time period, this was a dominant type across uh, the region of New England. Again, looking at a synchronic moment. If we think about synchronic as being a kind of slice of time, within that time, what do we see? This also corresponds in some ways to Dietz's idea of the peak, the peak of forms. So we could say that the salt box house has its peak within a specific time period. And then we would look synchronically across that here establishing a series of examples, all of which have certain primary and secondary characteristics in common. Uh, specifically, these are really located around the transformation of the traditional hall and parlor to room house into the salt box house. So we see the remnants of the hall and parlor house here. 
and then the addition of the lean-to in the back. It's the addition of the lean-to that gives the salt box house its specific and primary characteristic. So that is the, 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 the single-story lean-to at the rear of the house that was almost always used uh, to form a kitchen and to move the working dirty work of the house to the rear of the house. We also see some other uh, primary characteristics, one of which is the central chimney. And this is something that's consistent across this house form across time. On this slide, we have several examples of salt box houses. The upper left hand corner is a 17th century example. And then the latter two or below it are both contemporary examples. The example on the right is actually uh, a, a real estate developer um, document from the uh, late 20th century uh, post-war period. So we're seeing again the central chimney, the symmetrical front, and then of course the lean-to in the back. So even as the internal floor plan changes somewhat over time as modern life changes, the outer form, the primary characteristics of this house form remain constant over time. And then we can also look at the transformation of the salt box house into the eye house, uh, which uh, Dietz also talks about and I show examples of in the other slideshow for this week. Okay, as we look at the manifestation and then transformation and spread of types, so we've started by creating a typology. We look for patterns within a set of objects, but we can also look at how these ideas about form spread over time, how they diffuse is the word that's used across space and time. If we stick with the example of folk housing, uh, we can look at the work of Fred Niffen and then later Henry Glassie, who mapped specific regions of folk housing across the eastern United States. And what uh, both Niffen and Glassie were doing is looking on the landscape, identifying specific forms, and then mapping those forms to see how they spread across space. They identified uh, four major regions of cultural origin, New England, the Middle Atlantic, the Upland South, and the Tidewater South. And they showed how ideas of form diffused or flowed from these specific cultural centers. Now, again, we could say this approach is very Eurocentric, right? It's looking at specifically at origins within major uh, areas of settlement during the colonial period. And then how, but what I want you to take away from this is more how the idea of form spreads, right? So we can say, okay, there were ideas about housing that originate in New England that then spread across the northern uh, part of the United States as people moved. So too did ideas about form and housing form move as well. So we can trace these also from the Mid-Atlantic, probably the Philadelphia area and Pennsylvania, um, then across west, across Ohio and the Midwest, or down the old Conestoga Wagon Road, down into the mountain, down through the Appalachians. Um, we can see that kind of secondary vein coming down from number two would be uh, those folks who traveled down the Appalachian Trail. And then we have also the spread of ideas down the coast to the south. And you'll see there's a, a then a fourth area down here, uh, which is less prominently um, noted in the former slide, but would be the migration of ideas up from the Caribbean, right? So we'll, we're talking about the shotgun house this week. That's a formal understanding that comes from the Caribbean up through Louisiana and then spreads across the lower south. So this is cultural diffusion across space and time. And as a result of this cultural diffusion, we also see the emergence of uh, synchronically of specific house types that become then constant vernacular house types that characterize the region of the country. So uh, moving south to uh, where we are here in Georgia, we can identify throughout the um, upper and lower south a specific set of types, again, this is both synchronic and diachronic in that these forms do emerge over time. 
But at this point, we're kind of looking synchronically. We're looking at the landscape as it is now, and we're identifying specific housing types that characterize that region. Uh, these would include the I house, which I mentioned before, which of course was the model for many plantation homes. Uh, there's the saddlebag. And then the single pen, which is similar to a shotgun house in that it is a single uh, room mast, uh, but we, we see there's a location of a fireplace a chimney on the side of the house. And this can also be multiplied into the double pen house, which is very similar uh, to the I house. One very distinctive southern house type is the dog trot house. Which is, to, uh, which is the kind of opening up of a double penthouse to include a, a central passageway. Again, we can see this as an adaptation to the southern climate, which allowed for airflow uh, throughout the house. And then, of course, the shotgun house, which I discuss in another slide presentation. So we look across time, across space. We look diachronically. We look synchronically. Let's take a look at a second concrete example. Tables. Here we have a set of tables, but I think if we start to look closely at them, we can see that they're very different kinds of tables. Uh, some of them have a similar, seem to have a similar form and function. Others seem to be uh, very different. So let's take a closer look. What is the form of a table? In its most basic sense, a table is some sort of flat surface which is raised above the ground and held up by a series of symmetrically arranged poles or, or what we call legs. Okay, so that's its essential tableness. It's a surface, something that we sit at, uh, something that can hold things up above the ground. We don't know of any examples of tables that don't have some sort of surface that is propped up by some kind of leg. But we know that there are many forms of tables, so if we're going to look at identifying a table form, the first thing we would look at are its primary characteristics, the nature, the height, the nature of the surface, both its dimensions as well as its configuration. We would also look at whether the table has any specific kinds of storage or whether it, and whether it's meant to be sat at by one single person or by multiple people. Is there any sort of way in which the table is fundamentally constructed that's unique? Secondarily, we might look at other appendages, right? So we might look at the style of the legs or the configuration of the legs. Is it a gate leg table? Is it a pedestal table? We might look at the nature of the decoration and maybe even possibly at some secondary aspects of function in order to understand our form. So let's try this with some particular tables. Here's an example of two card tables from the early 19th century in Massachusetts. If we look more closely, we can say, okay, well, these are tables. They're in a certain style. We could certainly look at the fact that they're pretty much a neoclassical style, the very slender legs, the inlay, um, the slightly Grecian um, tone of the uh, shape around the edges of the table. But we're not talking about style, right? We're talking about form. So at best, these things we notice initially are in fact, at best secondary characteristics, but more likely style. Okay, so now let's compare these to two other card tables from about 20 years before. We can see that stylistically, they're very different. Right? One on the right is very Chippendale with the um, talon and ball um, leg, but these are also card tables. How do we know what this form is? So let's look and think in terms of a series. If we compare them to the prior ones, we'll notice that all of these tables have a doubled top, right? First of all, they're all about the same dimensions. The tabletop surface is very similar in each of the four examples. Then we also notice that they all have this doubled top. This is a very important primary characteristic of this table form. 
because it allows the table to be opened up and slid across to form a, a larger surface. Here we have a mid 18th century Chippendale card table, very similar to the one in the prior slide. And we can see how it opens up and creates a larger surface. We also see that it can seat four people and that there are little cups or storage areas on each side of the table, presumably for individual use. These could hold um, gaming pieces. Now we're starting to get a clearer sense of this form and function and its function, right? That this has to be, uh, have several different aspects in order to be an 18th, early 19th century card table. One is that it has to have this double top that opens up. This suggests to us also that the card table is not a temporary feature of a room, but probably something that was stored in a corner or used in a different way and then opened up and brought out for the activity specifically of card playing. We can certainly distinguish our card table from another smallish table from a similar period. This is a writing table, again from, from the uh, colonial American period. But we can see that its form is actually both similar and different. It is some kind of occasional table, yes, but it is not four-sided. It is actually has only one side facing forward, the other side clearly meant to be placed up against a wall therefore uh, more likely to be permanently placed in a room. It has a lot of storage in the front and a place for a single person to sit. So in this case, we can start to see like here are two smaller sized tables of a similar period, but very different function and therefore a very different form. We could also look at our card tables or our writing tables across time and establish a peak period for card tables. Um, uh, in Dietz's idea to understand that this form is most prevalent during a specific time period. In the case of card tables, the 18th and 19th century, during which card playing was a widespread social activity, particularly among the upper classes who could afford such tables and had the leisure to engage in such activities. Writing tables, again, would have been confined to a specific class. Uh, people who could afford to have a special table just for writing and, of course, were literate. Um, but again, we can probably look and establish a diachronically a kind of peak and horizon for this form as well. One more kind of table. Here again, we have very similar artifacts from uh, slightly different periods, but more or less late 18th, early 19th century. And they are all different styles of dining tables. Now, let's take a look again at primary and secondary characteristics. The main thing we notice about the dining room table is it has a much larger surface area. And in some cases, they have leaves, which can be inserted in it to make it even larger. So this is clearly a table that is used for seating more than four people, uh, many more people, and might even be expanded to include even more people for special occasions. But at any rate, we can say that the size and dimensions of this table are what primarily identify it as a dining table. We could also look at variations in the legs. We could say, well, there's gate leg tables, there's tables that expand with leaves. These are secondary characteristics. Uh, these tables can have any number of secondary characteristics, but they will still suggest to us a dining room table. Here's a contemporary example. Again, the shape of the surface is different. It's now round, which suggests less formal dining. Um, and of course, its materials of construction and its, its uh, style are very, very different. So again, we recognize this as a dining table, but uh, of a much uh, sort of secondary form, if you will, a variation uh, for more informal dining. We could also look at variations in leg. Here we have, again, a round dining table, but with a pedestal base. Again, can be very modern or very traditional in its construction. And also, again, part of form will also be dimensions. These are fairly large tables, not as large as our big rectangular tables, but, but fairly large, particularly if we compare them to this tea table from the 18th century.
And here again, if we think about primary and secondary characteristics, uh, we can say, okay, so this has a certain surface, it's decorative, it's uh, smaller, um, clearly not meant to have formal seating around it. Uh, we also notice that it its top flips. And this is again an important primary characteristic of this as a tea table. Something that would not again have been a permanent uh, part of the room setup, but would have been brought out strategically, um, opened up and used for tea service. And again, we can definitely also map this across time and space and understand how it probably has its height um, during a period in which tea drinking is an, is an important uh, cultural and social activity. But again, from a formal understanding, we can. it is primarily its dimensions, its shape, and then its functional feature of the flip top that identify it as a tea table. So these are some examples of ways in which you can create a series of objects uh, diachronic or synchronic uh, and we can understand the way in which each of the objects in this series have something in common that establish a form, a type, and then how we can map that type across space and time.